Hey guys, it's Peter, and welcome to my channel, Peterisms, where I tell stories in my life and just little things that I have learned as I've grown into the person that I am today. And I was reading through the comments that you guys have left me in my last couple videos, and you actually gave me some fantastic topics to talk about um, in videos over here. And I've actually received, since I said something about it in a video, well, I've, I say it a lot in videos, but um, if you want to DM me topics for videos as well, I feel free to do that. You can email me as well. My email's listed below. Um, if you don't feel comfortable leaving a comment about whatever. Um, if it's a very specific story, I'll probably take something from it and pull from it um, and not make it that specific about what you're talking about if it's really personal, if that makes sense. Um, and of course, I'll leave it anonymous as well if you want to email me or DM me. So um, I've gotten a couple DMs and a couple emails from people asking me to talk about specific topics. So you guys have given me a lot of topics to talk about. But I saw this comment on here um, and it was about myself in recovery, but also my mother in early recovery and our relationship in early recovery. And it's actually something that I love to talk about. And um, with my sober friends, it's something that actually comes up quite a bit. Um, because as I have gone through the years of being sober and things like that, the more people that I know that will have like a spouse get sober or a parent or a sibling get sober. And so they'll say, well, like, how did you maneuver this with your mom and things like that? And so it's a topic that I love to talk about. Well, I love to talk about addiction and recovery. You guys know that I'm very passionate about it. Um, so I want to read the comment first. I'm going to kind of go back because it has multiple questions in it. And then I'm going to go back and... Um, respond to this because I think it's a really great topic. I think one of the things that we don't talk about enough when we talk about addiction, I mean, you know, I think we talk a lot about our own stories or we try to educate people on ways to find help or seek treatment, 12-step um, programs versus MAP programs or spirituality, finding church if that works for you, whatever you do to stay sober, right? We talk about all those different ways. But one of the things that we don't often talk about because it's usually people that are sober that are talking about it. Um, is we don't typically talk about the, the family system around an addict or an alcoholic and how deeply family members are affected by our addiction. Um, and I, th I think it's something that we all know. I just think it's something that's not talked about enough, you know? And I don't even know that I really got it for years and years and years. Like, I knew, you know, getting sober at 22, I knew that I had impacted my family. I knew that I had impacted... A lot of it I kept hidden from my mom. And she was also in her, like, heavy addiction at that time, too. But my dad and my stepmom were very aware of what was going on. I hid a lot from them, but they knew enough to know that it was bad, right? And, um... And so, you know, years, years, I think it's been since I've been on YouTube. It was a couple years ago. I can't remember, four or five years ago. Um, I finally was listening to the audiobook uh, Beautiful Boy by David Sheff, which is the, his son wrote one, two. I think his son wrote two or three books called, about his meth addiction. One was called uh, Tweak. His son's name is Nick Sheff. And, um, but David Sheff wrote a book called Beautiful Boy, which has gotten really, really famous. They go around and speak together. And his book is about his son's, like, addiction like growing over years and his inability to set boundaries and limits and how he enabled his son and how he enabled his son because he was afraid for his son like that's one of the pieces of enabling that we don't talk about we always look at it as like this really like negative thing right but when people typically enable addict behavior it's because they're afraid they're afraid that they're going to lose a relationship with that person they're afraid that that person's going to die um and so they minimize the enabling things right um of which my dad did a lot of that he, if he was sitting right here he'd say yeah absolutely 100 percent. i enabled a lot until i knew better and so when when I read this book, I called my dad and I was like, "Did have you ever read this book, Beautiful Boy? It had been out at that point like 10 years or something like that. And I just had never, I ended up watching the movie. The, the movie is okay. Like if you, if you didn't read the book and you watched the movie, the movie would be great. But the book is so much better. And at the very end, the dad talks about all the things he did wrong that he wished he had known earlier because he tries to educate other family members and parents in the same situation. And so I remember calling my dad and I was like, have you ever read this book? And he was like, oh yeah, I read it first when it first came out. And I was like, how did you even hear about it? He was like, I don't know, New York Times or something like that. I read an article about it. And I was like, was this what it was like for you? He was like, that was exactly what it was like for me. And I, you know, not that it matters, but like my addiction wasn't meth, but he was like the fear that I had of not knowing where you were, or I wouldn't hear from you for days on end, things like that. He was like, that was what I lived with every single day, you know? Um, and it's interesting how, like, that's where I'm such a believer that a drug is a drug is a drug, and that it doesn't really matter what you're using, the way that it affects you, the way that it affects your family, the way that it affects your friends, um, is ultimately the same in the behaviors that it has. I think with specific drugs, you have different specific behaviors, but overall, it 
impacts families in a negative way. And so I got this comment, I just wanted to say all that first. I got this comment and uh, she said, thank you for sharing, this is on my video called Finding Freedom from Codependency. Thank you for sharing your experience, Peter. I have a question and I hope it's not crossing a personal line. No, not at all, it, wasn't, it didn't cross a personal line at all. I remember from your stories, your mother got sober six months after you did. So my, my sobriety birthday is December 17th of 1994. My mother's sobriety birthday was June 2nd of 1995. So it was about six months uh, that my mom got sober after I did. Um, I remember from your stories, your mother got sober six months after you did. You know, one of the things that kind of makes me sad, honestly, today, uh, like making videos and talking about this on YouTube, is that I don't, like I've said this a lot, I don't know that my mom would understand the YouTube thing, the video, she wouldn't get all that, right? But to sit down and be able to share our stories together, and one of the things that we did talk to a lot of people about that we knew was um, how greatly our recoveries had improved our relationship, and that we spoke this language of recovery that just took our relationship to a whole nother level. I can only imagine that, like, just sitting here, you know, doing videos with my mom talking about like our recoveries and her point of view and my point of view and things like that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't really often think about that. I was just thinking about that when you asked this question. So thank you for kind of giving me a glimpse of what that could have looked like. What was the first year of sobriety like maintaining your relationship with a mother who went from a using alcoholic to a sober one? Good question. What struggles did the relationship face? How did you find out she was starting a program? And I can only imagine there were several cathartic moments. Did you sit down and discuss who was going to which meetings to keep it separate? Very good question. I pray every day for my mother to choose sobriety. She said, I am 37, she is 56. Your stories and sharing, uh, sharing, you hear people finding sobriety in their 50s, 60s, and 70s gives me so much hope. Well, thank you for the questions, and absolutely 100%. I have so many friends of mine that are getting sober. My mom was 51 when she got sober, and um, that's why I say don't ever give up hope. And I will say that at the time that my mom got sober, 51, was older, I would say, but like, I mean, a lot of people were getting sober in their 30s, early 40s, but I would say 51 at the time that she got sober, there were a lot of people that were getting, not a lot, but there were more people that were getting sober. Today, for somebody to come in in their 50s is like nothing. 60s and 70s, I see people all the time that are coming in getting sober in their 60s and their 70s. It's usually like after a, a spouse dies and they want to improve their life or they've gotten divorced or their children have gone to college or they're having grandkids and they don't want to see their grandkids, you know, want, don't want their grandkids to see them growing up, like, you know, as an alcoholic and as an addict and things like that. Very different reasons, but, or maybe they're just alone and they realize they don't want to continue to live that way. So one of the things I will say is there's a lot I remember and there's a lot I don't remember because it's been 29 and a half years at this point since I got sober. Um, it's crazy to think now that if my mom were still alive that we would both be 29 years sober. It seems surreal, you know? Um, my mom was born in 43, so she would be 81 this year. I mean, that's also surreal to think. Um, but so anyway, um, the first year, well, the first six months maneuvering, and I told the story a lot, but when I was getting out of treatment, my counselor in treatment had me call numerous people that I was still really close with. So one of the things that happened when I was in treatment was that I was trying to keep a lifeline to the outside. I was constantly calling people that I was partying with and things like that, and I wanted to constantly know what was going on. There was a guy I had been dating. He was actually somebody that I did a lot of drugs with, and so I was constantly trying to keep tabs on where he was. I can remember sitting on the payphone one time and I was like asking all these questions and she came over and she just hung up the phone and she was like, we're done. We're not doing this anymore. If you're going to stay here and be focused. And it was never like I, you had to do that. It was like, if you want to stay here, then you're going to stay here and you're going to do it my way. Or you can leave. You can check yourself out. You can go. I don't care. Well, I knew I couldn't do that. So I just, at that point, I kind of like really stopped interacting with anybody on the outside. It was probably one of the best things that happened to me. We were saying in recovery that so if you hang around a barbershop long enough, you're going to get your hair cut. Meaning that if you continue to hang around the same places and same things, you're going to go back to what you were doing before. Um, it's the reason why we, so in 12-step programs, push changing people, places, and things. Because you have to change the culture of addiction into a culture of recovery. It's very, very important. Um, and early recovery. I think the longer in recovery you get, you know, I don't think it's as tricky. You know, I mean, I don't think I would hang out, you know, at crack houses and stuff like that like I did when I was using. But um, to go to like do a bar and stuff like that. And actually like our basic text and stuff tells us if you have a reason to be there, there's no reason why you can't. Um, and so that when I, before I got out of treatment, um, 
had to call numerous people and say like, I, I can't continue to hang out with you. Which is interesting in retrospect because I, I was so nervous to do that. They would be like so offended by it. Like nobody really seemed to care in all honesty. I think in retrospect, they didn't want me to ruin their good time kind of, you know? I don't know that that was like, they were that aware of that, but I don't remember anybody being like, oh my God, you can't hang out with me anymore. I don't remember it ever being like that. But I can remember talking to my counselor about my mom specifically because my mom was somebody that triggered me. She made me like, like we would get in, you know, arguments and I would want to drink and whatever. And so, um, but also, I don't know. I just like, she was somebody that her drinking really triggered me a lot too. And, um, and I don't blame her for that. I mean, what I did, there's a lot of people that have parents that drink that don't drink and don't abuse drugs. That was what I did with it. That's just my story. Um, so when I was talking about people that were dangerous for me to have an early sobriety, she, she said something about my mom. And I was like, so you want me to have a conversation with my mom where I tell her I can't hang out with her? And she's like, I think that you need to do that if you're really serious about your recovery. And by the time that I got out of treatment, I was so scared to get out. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was really scared that I couldn't stay sober. I was pretty sure I would go back to using. So I did have that conversation with my mom. And I can remember she was very upset. She was like, I, I like, you can't mean me. Like, really? Do you mean me? And I was like, yeah, mom. Like, and that was really, to be honest with you, we had had a lot of conversations about my mom's drinking, but I didn't really ever until I went through treatment that last time have the language to use to know how to have those conversations with her. Like I didn't, I think that was really the first conversation where I basically kind of laid it on the line and I said, your drinking's an issue. Like, I mean, I had said those things to her before and in anger, like I'm so tired of you drinking or blah, 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 whatever. But that was like the first time that I really approached it, like coherently having a conversation with her where I said, your drinking is an issue for me. I, I'm scared when you drink. It worries me. It angers me. And those emotions are not healthy for me in early recovery. She didn't really understand it. Um, I think I saw her a few times the first six months. I really, to be honest with you, I don't remember. Um, I do remember thinking, and I, not just about my mom, but other people in, that I partied with, that I really thought, I, I really hoped that they would learn by what I had gone through, um, that they would get sober as well. And that really didn't happen <laughs> at all. In fact, I've lost quite a few friends that I used to party with from drugs and alcohol. I mean, they've passed away. Um, in fact, I think only... Well, there's a guy that I know and that we used to party back together, but I didn't know he was sober until a couple years ago. There's another girl that I used to party with. I think, I think there's probably four or five of us, six of us maybe, that used to party in a circle of like 30 back in the day. You know, like, I don't know, it was kind of ever-changing group, you know, but that I knew from back in the day going out. I'd say there's probably like five or six of us that are sober today um, in different programs and different lengths of time and things like that. I was definitely the first one at the time because it was kind of an unheard heard of thing. Um... I don't really remember, so I, I was really hoping like my mom, me being sober would like inspire my mom to get sober. That did not happen. My, so my cousin got married in June, my cousin Caroline, and uh, several weeks before that, my uncle, my uncle Dave, Caroline's dad, had um, a massive heart attack and had, uh, I think, quadruple bypass surgery and almost died. And so that was the moment that it switched for my mom. My mom was like, I don't care if I live another day, another year, another 10 years. Um, I want the quality of my life to improve. It literally had nothing to do with me being sober. I wish that had, I don't know that it matters why she got sober, but that's why my mom got sober, um, was because she just wanted the quality of her life to improve. She had been going to meetings for a while. Like, I mean, she hadn't been going for a while, but like she had a friend of hers. So I've told this story before. My mom had a friend of hers that was in Al-Anon for her husband. And so she, because of my problems, this friend took my mom to that meeting. One of the last Al-Anon meetings that my mom ever went to before she got sober, she was listening to a woman tell her story. They had um, somebody come in and tell their story. Like a lot of times, like, you know, alcoholics will go to Al-Anon meetings and tell their stories. And so she heard this woman telling her story and my mom was like, I'm in the wrong group. Like she's telling my story. Um, and that was kind of like a pivotal moment for her. What I didn't know until after my mom passed away was that I found all her coins. And when you relapse and recovery and you come back in, um, you get either a start of her keychain or a start of her coin, depending on what program you are. And then she had many start of her coins. And I was kind of surprised like how many times she had tried to get sober before it actually stuck. So June 2nd was when it stuck, 1995. She had tried multiple times to get sober before that. I just wasn't aware of that. She did tell me a couple times, she was like, I would drive around meetings like at churches and stuff and I just couldn't go in. I was too afraid to go in. Um, and so, 
Uh, it's one of the reasons why today, like, when anybody, like, a newcomer reaches out to me and is like, you know, I've never been to a meeting before, would you be willing to take me? I'm always like, absolutely, you know, like, um, and so, and there's a lot of ways that we do that, you know, but and introducing them to certain people and all that kind of stuff. Um, because it is scary. It is scary to walk into a meeting or to walk into treatment or to walk into a therapy session or whatever for the first time. You don't know what you're, you don't know what to expect, you know? Um, I would love to tell you that everybody's first experience is fantastic, but that's just not the case, you know? Some people's 10th experience isn't fantastic. And so for my mom, I think she tried it several times and then it kind of stuck. Um, she found a group of people that she was going with and whatever. The first social thing that I really remember doing with my mom, I mean, even like even having a cup of coffee after she got sober was my cousin's wedding which is in the middle of June and I remember I went with my mom to that wedding and we were both sober and it was like the first thing that we had done together sober and that was in the middle of June so I I think that was kind of when and she was I mean at that point she was like two or three weeks sober two weeks sober right so two and a half weeks sober I don't really remember us starting to really talk about, I think I was hesitant because I was like, I'm not sure it's going to stick like with her, like how she had been previous times with me when I had been in outpatient programs and stuff like that. I think I was kind of like, I'm not sure this is going to stick. Like, is she going to continue to stay sober and things like that? Um, and so I kind of waited because by then I was like in it to win it. I was like really deep in going to meetings, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so I was kind of, being safeguarded against it. I feel like it was maybe around August. I remember my um, friend of mine, that she was my roommate before and after, and then she was really supportive of my sobriety. She's my friend that lives in Germany now. She and I would come over here because this was my mom's condo, and we would like roll rollerblade around, and then the three of us would go up swimming to the pool late at night, and then we would come back here and drink coffee. And that was when I was sober because that would be like after a meeting that I would do that. I can remember coming up here, and like after my mom would go to a meeting and I would go to a meeting, we would sit and we would talk about the meeting, like what we learned from it. I mean, we just we talked a lot about recovery. Um, so. That was kind of the six, the first, the first six months to a year. Um, okay, well, I want to make sure I get these questions. What was your first year of sobriety like maintaining your relationship with the mother who went from using alcoholic to a sober one? So my relationship with her was that I wasn't really sure, and I don't think she was either. You know, um, one of the greatest things that came from our joint sobriety was that I, for the first time in a very long time, became was able to be the child and she was the adult. Um, and that switched pretty quickly on, I would say. The other thing I, I want to emphasize is that my mom would say to me that she was jealous that I went to treatment because she wanted to sit in groups and all this kind of stuff. My mom got very, very involved very quickly in a 12-step program. She was very respected in Indianapolis. She was what they call the big book thumper. I mean, she knew the literature inside and out, could quote it to you. I mean, she was like that with any literature, but when it came to recovery literature, she knew it all. Um, she went to a lot of meetings. My mom was sometimes going to two meetings a day for her first year. Um, and she was doing a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of step work and stuff like that. So she very quickly, I mean, I challenged everything. She challenged, I don't think, anything. Like, she went right into it. And I can remember about six months sober. It was around Christmas time, my mom said to me, because it says, you know, in her literature that the desire to use will be lifted from us. And I can remember that she said that early on, you know, that she believed that God had lifted the desire for her to use, that she had no desire to ever drink again, um, that she would continue to go to meetings and continue to work steps and things like that. But she truly believed that the desire to drink had been lifted from her. She really, truly believed that. Um, and so that was kind of like the first year. I think the first six months of her sobriety, which would be the tail end of my first year, was us really kind of not being sure of like, you know, um, yeah, I think that's it. I do remember my, it was like my year or two sober. My mom brought me like a plant to, I was working in treatment at that time and like a gift and some cards and stuff like that. And I was like wanting to keep it very, very hush hush. And some people at the front desk that met my mom, they're like, they knew her from meetings and stuff. And they're like, this is so nice. We didn't know it was Peter's sobriety birthday and stuff like that. And my mom was always very, very proud. She always, I'll be honest with you, my mom probably towards the last, I would say 10 years of her life did more for my sobriety birthday than she did for my birthday birthday. Um, I think it just, it meant more to us together. I think we understood what it meant to us. Um, and I would celebrate her birthday as well. So that was probably, I, I will think what's interesting is like kind of our varying stories. Like I've told the story about doing my fourth and fifth. So fourth step is you're searching, is doing a searching and fearless moral inventory of your life. And you do like a written inventory. And then a fifth step is where you go over it with somebody, typically your sponsor. 
And um, I can remember doing my fifth one. I did my fifth one at like a year. My mom did her sooner than that. And she went to this place called The Flowing Well in Carmel. It's very peaceful and all this kind of stuff. And I remember her like sponsor brought her a stone that said like serenity on it. There was like this whole deal. They did this whole spiritual deal to it, you know, ritual and all this kind of stuff. Did prayers around it already. Mine, and I was expecting to have something like that. And mine was sitting in my sponsor's basement while his kids ran around upstairs and his wife being like, y'all want some Kentucky Fried Chicken? I mean, it was like, it was not peaceful at all. And I think like, it's so funny when I look back on that, like what we both got out of those first experiences was very consistent with who we were as people. But my mom and I would laugh about stuff like that. You know, we knew a lot of the same people in recovery. Um, you asked me about the meeting, so I'll get to that because that was one thing that was really um, pretty hardcore for us. Um, how did you find out that she was starting a program? I honestly, I do not remember how I had that conversation with her. I don't remember. I don't, I, I don't, I don't remember having that conversation with her. I just, I feel like I just, I know. My uncle had a heart attack and then it was after that. I feel like she probably called me. I don't, I don't really remember. Honestly, I probably talked about it at some point when I did remember it, but I don't today. Um, I can only imagine there were several cathartic moments. Did you sit down and discuss? There were lots of cathartic moments. I think it was a lot of just like acknowledging our part and how we had hurt each other in our relationship, not just directly related to alcohol and drugs. My mother never used drugs, but just alcohol for her. But like, um, and how we had hurt each other. I think it was also, like I said, a language of understanding each other and where we came from. It made sense. It like, all of a sudden things kind of clicked into place. You know, there is a language that you use when you work a 12 step program. There are words that you use on a pretty regular basis. You talk about resentment, you talk about anger, you talk about fear. And so if I say to somebody else that's working a 12 step program, like, what do you think about fear? Like that means something different to them than if I would just pull somebody off the street and say like, tell me about a resentment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't do that to somebody. So it is a different kind of language that you speak you know when you're referencing a step or you're referencing a 12-step prayer like it means something to somebody differently that's in a 12-step program um in a way that it doesn't you know like okay often like okay we were so we were with my um in-laws this weekend and they were talking about the word um my husband brought up the saying by all means right and he was trying to translate it into like spanish like how you would translate like what what do we mean as a in kind of like slangish term like by all means and it's interesting because they were trying to like explain like what that would mean in spanish and whatever and there's not like a, a like an exact transition or a translation well the, th the same is true i would say with recovery like unless you've gone through it you don't really understand it so you can't really speak to that like so it's it's like to have that same conversation with somebody else about fear would not be the same conversation that I would have with somebody in recovery because it means completely two different things you know what I mean that was something that my mom and I really definitely got to share a lot of um okay let's see as far as the starting I don't know when she started I knew that she had been going to meetings like Al-Anon meetings before that I didn't know that but I didn't because she made it very clear she was going to Al-Anon for me <laughs> but I didn't know that she had tried to go to a lot of meetings before that I didn't actually find that out till I think she passed away um did you discuss which meetings you were going to keep? Okay, so my mom, very very early on, we had a discussion, and this was actually at the suggestion of both of our sponsors. They both said the exact same thing. They thought it was very important for us to keep our meetings separate. If we wanted to do, like, one social meeting, like, a week or a month together where we went just heard, like, a lead, somebody sharing a lead that that was fine, but um, that we should keep our meetings separate. That way, if my mom wanted to share something that was unique or specific to her, that she would feel comfortable sharing it without me sitting there listening or judging or thinking in my head how it related to me and vice versa. Um, and, and that we also were never gonna listen to each other's leads. And a lead is when you share your story in recovery. That we were never gonna sit and listen to somebody's lead and think, or listen to each other's leads and things like that. So keeping our meetings separate was something that was very, very important. Um, I can only ever remember and I, I don't even know if this is a real memory, but I feel like it was, I feel like I went to one speaker meeting with my mom and it was at the treatment facility that I went to. I feel like I see her sitting there, but I don't even know that. But I can tell you after that, we never went to meetings together. In fact, it was interesting because um, when I would go, like after my mom passed away, I started going to some of the meetings that she would go to back in the day and I would introduce myself and I would say, like, not like in the meeting, but like before the meeting or whatever, I was talking to people and I would say, I'm so-and-so's son. And they would say, oh my God, we loved your mom. Oh, we didn't know that that was you. Or other people I could see at meetings, like before my mom passed away, they'd say, oh, you're so-and-so's son. Like, oh my God, she goes to my, you know, Tuesday night or whatever. And, um, and stuff like that. So we, we kept, it's interesting because 
When my mom was in the hospital, she had a group of women from her 12-step program that came to visit her. And I didn't know a lot of these women because they were they went to a lot of different meetings. I actually met a lot of people through that were friends of my mom's that helped when she was in the hospital. So that was really cool to see as well. Um, oh, I got out of the comment. Hold on. So, but yes, we, and I, and I recommend this to couples specifically. Um, I know a lot of couples that go to meetings together. I just don't know how you can have your own individualized recovery or it wasn't even if I was going to go to a meeting and let's say if the topic was resentment and I was going to say I have a resentment against my mom. Like it, we're not even talking about that. Like if I was going to, we were talking about relationships and recovery. Maybe I wouldn't be as comfortable talking about that with my mom staying in the room as I would by myself. And I wouldn't share as authentically and honestly, you know, and that was important to me and that was important to her. So that was why it was important for us to keep that separate, especially since both of our sponsors were guiding us in that direction. I've actually had a lot of couples, because I've talked about that in meetings, I've had, like, my mom and I set very strict boundaries with, you, with each other over our recoveries. I've actually had a lot of couples come up to, to me and ask me, like, what do you think? And I'm like, I, I just don't think that there's a reason. Like, go to one or two meetings if you want to go to as a social meeting. But to sit in a group, I mean, how are you going to sit when you just had a fight three days ago and talk about you're pissed off at your spouse and it's affecting, you know, like you're feeling triggered to drink when they're sitting right across? You can't have that conversation. So, you know, and not everything needs to be brought to a meeting. You can talk to your sponsor about those things, too, and your support network and whatever. But I just think... I I think it's healthier to keep those things. That's just what I've experienced and what was suggested to me. That's just what works for me. I do know a lot of couples and I do know grandmothers and grandsons and, you know, parents and children that go to meetings together and it works just fine for them. Aunts and uncle or aunts and nieces and uncles and nephews and nieces and stuff and all kinds of different relationships that go to meetings together. Not all of them, but like maybe once in a while they'll be like, oh, my grandma's over there or whatever. And you know, that's great, you know, like, and it works for them. But I don't know, for my mom and I, it was something that was very very serious for us um and then she said i pray every day for my mother to choose sobriety i will say this tanya is the first person that really said this to me this way we have a friend of ours that went back out using after 21 years i miss her every single day and people ask all the time they're like well you do not talk to her anymore because she's not sober no we reached out to her quite a bit it was she that chose to not contact us anymore because i don't know if her new lifestyle didn't adhere to that but she was a good friend of mine for like I mean I don't know 18 20 years of my sobriety and um I can remember Tanya and I talking one time about I was like I really hope that you know she comes back in one day and you know chooses sobriety and what my sponsor said to me about somebody else at the time my sponsor has since passed away he said it's maybe that's not what God's plan is you can't decide for somebody else what God's plan is. God's plan might be for them to find church or go on a mission trip or do this program. Maybe a 12 step program is not what God has wanted for them if you really believe in that, you know? And I was like, okay. And then Tanya said that people have to feel enough pain before they want to make a change. And I really, really believe that, you know, which I think is why it's important to discuss topics like enabling or, you know, things like that. It's like, People have to, or suffering consequences and whatever, people have to feel enough pain before they're going to make some changes. They really, really do. And especially with addiction, you know? When addiction's going good, you know, we say, like, a lot of people in recovery will say, well, there was no giggle left in the bottle. I think one of the reasons why it was so hard for me at the beginning was even as bad as it was, even as ugly and gross and disgusting as it was, as life-threatening as it was, there was still a little giggle left in the bottle for me, and that was a little giggle that I was holding on to. But people aren't going to make changes until they, you know, feel enough pain. But for anybody out there asking, there are sister programs, the 12-step programs like Al-Anon that are for friends and family members of alcoholics and addicts. You won't go in there. They won't tell you how to fix them. They'll tell you how to fix you and how you are in relation to that alcoholic or addict in your life. And um, you can Google search whatever city you're in and it'll tell you where an Al-Anon meeting is in your area. Um, or find counseling or a good support network, but um, there's help out there for all of us. So anyway, thank you for asking those questions. This was, a, I really enjoyed doing this video today. Um, I think probably when I look back on my life, the proudest thing I've ever been of in my entire life is my sobriety. I wouldn't have my education, my marriage, my relationships. I wouldn't have YouTube, anything today if it weren't for my sobriety. And I know that my mom felt the same way. And that was, I know, such a bonding part for us. And I'm so grateful that I was able to have that with my mom. So thank you for asking the question. I really appreciate it. And I love you guys. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.